What a blessing it is to be gathered together as the house of the Lord. From time to time, we need to remember this building is a building. It is not the church. This building is not a tabernacle. We don't even qualify as an edifice. <laughs> but praise God, we qualify as walking as the body of Christ. Amen. We do that together. And I prayed something this morning that I want to emphasize. When everything is said and done, after we have discussions, after we come together and reason together, if God is the center of that reasoning and if God is leading in that discussion and we are yielded to God in our listening, we will end up with the same opinion. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, in our nation today, we've been raised in such a way that we think that our opinion matters. Mm -hmm. You've got to be careful when you hear what I'm saying now. <coughs> Opinions do matter. But your opinion does not make fact. Amen. We're studying belief. We saw Elijah following God's leadership. In result of that story is the prophets of Baal died, lost their lives for being false prophets. We're studying belief. He followed in belief everything that God said that he was to do. Today we're going to look, and it will probably take us a few weeks to go through this, but we're going to start looking at a New Testament example of belief. God willing and give me the wisdom, we'll break that down in this short passage and see what the early church actually looked like. Now, as I say that, understand, the peripherals do not make the church. Mm -hmm. Did they meet in the local Jewish sanctuary? Not for very long once the Jews realized what they were teaching. Did they rent the town hall? I don't think so. <laughs> Scripture says they met from house to house. And we probably need to begin planning how to do that again depending on how things go, as far as the law is concerned. But we want to see not the peripherals, but the center truth of what this passage is telling us. So if you would, turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Peter's been preaching. He's been preaching pretty strongly. Several occasions we read where he's preached strong enough to tell the Jews that they killed Jesus. They crucified him. Well, we can argue over who killed Jesus. I believe personally that you and I killed Jesus. Amen. He died for our sin. And the sin of those who persecuted him and for the sins of those who called for his death. That's a powerful example for us. Mm -hmm. He took no thought for himself, yes. but he was faithful even to death, the death on the cross. I'm going to pick up with verse 36. Therefore let the house of Israel know assuredly that God made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified Lord and Christ. Both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? 
Then Peter said unto them, Repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And, that, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles, and all that believed were together and had all things common. Sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness, of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Amen. There's a lot of power in this passage. Yes. Truth is, when you start openly and honestly looking into God's Word, you find power in every passage. Yes. There's something there. If it wasn't something there for you, it wouldn't be contained in the Word. As I've said many times, and it's not my favorite chapters, but even the begots, or begets, have meaning. They show the history of Israel. They show the history running down through these generations till the promised seed came, Jesus Christ, the Lord, the Savior. Savior. The Jewish word is the Mishak. That's the best I can say it. Uh, the Messiah. Mm -hmm. So let's go back. First of all, I want to reemphasize, I do this every message, at least I try to. Verse 38, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The first step that you have in your journey into a life with God is the step of faith. It is a step of decision. It is a step of commitment. Mm -hmm. You may not realize fully all that you are committing to when you come to Christ. First of all, you can't understand all of it until you are a child of God. You can understand the history. You can read the stories. But until you come to know Christ as Lord and Savior, you don't understand the spiritual implications of God's Word. Except for that part that says to you, you are lost and undone. You are on the way to hell. You can't save yourself. You need a Savior. Amen. That Savior is Jesus Christ. Our Lord. Our Master. If we choose to follow Him. Peter's given an, an open invitation here. He starts with a most important thing. Repent. Mm -hmm. Yes. Repent. Yes, yes. I haven't preached on that lately. What does repent mean? It means you're headed in one direction with your life. Spiritually, emotionally, financially, everything is, in, is involved in going in one direction. But you come to Christ and your life turns completely around. Now, instead of serving yourself, you're serving God. Yes. 
Now, instead of going your own way, you begin to go God's way. And I, 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 I tell you, one of the most difficult things for us to do is to continue going in God's way. Now, why is it difficult? Because the enemy continues to throw things at you to discourage you, to slow you down, to hold you back. The scripture I have quoted so often. I love it. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Let me expound on that this morning. Greater is he that is in me. Who is that? Holy Spirit. That's the presence of God. This presence of Jesus. In the form of the Holy Spirit. He's dwelling within us. The moment you ask Christ to come into your life, the Holy Spirit enters in order to seal you unto the day of redemption. What do you mean seal me? I don't know if you've ever seen a movie or a program where they're loading trucks and when they're done loading the truck, they'll close the gate on the back and they'll pull over this, this latch and then they'll stick a seal to that latch. And generally you'll see that they have a stamp and they stamp it. And they do that so they will know if anybody has messed with the contents of the truck between loading and unloading. It's a seal that by its very presence protects the cargo. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit. And I quoted already, unto the day of redemption, unto the fulfillment of of our redemption. We're saved now, we are being saved, and we will be saved is how it plays out in the Greek. I'm saved now. If I die now, I go to and spend eternity with Christ. But I'm being saved throughout my life. And I will be saved in the ultimate moment where I leave this life and I open my eyes in the presence of God. Are you in that position today? Have you truly asked Christ, God for Christ's sake, to forgive you of your sin? And committed your life to Him in that process? I've said it before. I've said it many times since I've been here. There's too many preachers these days that don't talk about the commitment. Too many preachers today that talk about what you can get from God. Yes, that's right. It's kind of becoming a theme with me because I see it growing all around us. This is a house of worship. That's right. You understand? Amen. Not a house of getting. <laughs> Not a house of give me. Not a house of you owe me, God. Yes. I trusted you. You owe me. Wow. It's a house where we come together to worship. That means to take our hearts, our mind, our spirit, and open to the spirit to teach us, to grow us. Mm -hmm. But our heart needs to be giving, not taking. Yes. Faith means absolute trust. Amen. Yes. Not convenient trust. Okay. Not necessarily easy trust. Yes. But absolute trust that God is absolutely honest in what He says. And He is the most honest being that there is in keeping His promises. And He will do in your life everything His Word promises that He will do. Amen. Now there are people that take that and twist it to say that means if you want a swimming pool, you can have a swimming pool because God wants you to have a swimming pool. <laughs> Why does God want you to have a swimming pool? Because you want one. That's, that's the actual reasoning. Let's go back to a basis of belief. Because you believe doesn't make it so. You believe because it is so. Your belief activates in your life 
communion with God through the Spirit. Okay. In that communion with God, as you look into His Word, as you come on Sunday mornings or Wednesday nights and we share the Word, you receive from God the Word. It is to be engrafted into your life. It is to become the moral center of your life. It is to become the power of your life. It is to become that which drives you day by day. Amen. Jesus central. Amen. Jesus above yes. all others. That's right. All other what? Any other. Yeah, amen. Whatever it is. Whoever it is. Jesus above family. Mm -hmm. Some people say, well, wait a minute. I thought I'm supposed to love my family. You are. Gentlemen, you're supposed to love your family and provide for your family. That's a requirement of walking rightly before God. But in that, family is second to Christ. Amen. Yes. Amen. But now here's the other side of that. When you have your family where you treat them as Christ would, your family is better off being in second place. Amen. Your family in first place dilutes what God can do with you or even for you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Heard another pastor this morning say, it doesn't do you any good to be praying to God to bless you when you're living in abject sin. You're living with your boyfriend or your girlfriend, but you're crying out to God to bless you. It doesn't work. You're stealing from the company, but you're calling out for God to bless you. It doesn't work. You hate one another in the church sometimes. But you call out to God. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Did you know there should be no division in the house of God? Amen. That's right. There should be no division among the members. Now, I've got to be careful. That doesn't mean that one of you likes hot dogs and another one likes hamburgers and you think that you're right and they're wrong. That's baloney. <laughs> but, You can come together and eat them both. Amen. But when it comes to truth, it's established within your spirit. And as it is established within your spirit, you are strengthened to know even more of what the spirit is teaching. You learn from it. Now there's a second point I want to make out of these verses we just read. When you get down to verse uh, 41. Let's go to verse 40. With many other words did he testify and exhort saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. And I believe God is crying out to us today. Save yourselves from this untoward, ungodly, unfaithful, unbelieving generation. Amen. Yes. When God called you, He called you out of something to place you into something. Amen. He called you out of a life of sin. Called you out of a life of misery. And some people say, well, wait a minute, I'm still poor. Why are you miserable because you're poor? You're rich in Christ. Amen. And the riches of Christ are greater than the riches of this world. Amen. You trust Christ in spite of many times what your eyes and ears are telling you. You trust Christ because of what the Word says. And here we see that we are secondly separated by baptism. Separated by baptism. Verse 41, Then they, they gladly received His word, were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Separated. 
When you're baptized, it means something. Mm -hmm. it, it represents something. We're going to look at that in just a moment. Understand, it's more than just joining a church. It's more than just getting wet. It's an announcement. Yes. It's a proclamation. Mm -hmm. It's saying I've put my faith in Christ and now I'm going to walk with Him. When I baptize you, I will tell you at the end of that, baptize in the likeness of His death, raised up to walk in newness of life. Amen. In Christ, when you come to Him, you should have a new life. Uh, I don't know that we'll get back to Acts this morning. We'll turn to, to Romans chapter 6. Let me give you the picture. You've put your faith in Christ. You've trusted His Word. You have become a child of God. Now we can argue all day about whether you have to be baptized to be saved. And I will tell you from my opinion, you do not simply because of one thing. God does not make exceptions. The thief on the cross was not baptized. Some say, well, somebody snuck him down and baptized him alone. He was not baptized. And yet what did Jesus tell him while he was still alive? This day shalt thou be with me in paradise. Amen. Now that's a conundrum you can work on all you want to. But I'm going to tell you something about this separation uh, that comes by baptism you need to understand. You're never going to be fully empowered as a child of God if you have not been baptized. Amen. It is the first step of faith after coming to Christ. Yes. It is the public declaration. I put my faith in Christ. Amen. And I'm going to follow Him. Now I'm going to get ugly for a moment. I don't care how afraid you are of water. The tub's not that deep and I'll be right there to bring you back up. You won't drown. I've had several people tell me, I can't be baptized, I'm afraid of water. And I don't understand that. You've just placed your faith in Christ. Don't you trust Him enough to at least help you to do the first thing you're supposed to do? Chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? What's the next two words? God forbid. God forbid. King James says. So the question is asked. Shall we keep sinning so that God's grace is evident as He saves us from this sin? Shall we keep sinning so they can see that we can survive even though we sin? Can't we have sin be a, an outreach for the church? God forbid. We would never do that, would we? We could have a marijuana party in the basement. Everybody would feel good. Forbid. Maybe. God forbid. God forbid. Now, people don't think I'm picking on one group of people, but we could have gambling in the basement. Man, we could buy some of those machines and the church would make money and people would come in. God forbid. God forbid. Now, here's the problem. If you don't do it in the church, why do you do it outside of the church? What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the living God? Yes. Anything you won't do in here, and I heard this this morning and it went right along with my heart and I said, Amen. Anything you do 
or excuse me, would not do in the church, you should not do outside of the church. Amen. Now there are some things of just common consideration and courtesy. There are things that I don't do in the church that I do outside of the church. I don't kiss my wife in the church like I do outside the church. Now that's just a blunt example. Why? Unless I'm getting married again, it's not the place for it. Right? Amen. Well, some of you aren't so sure. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, understand that when we put that faith in Christ, we have made a commitment. And this says, shall we continue in sin? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Christ gives you the ability to have that attitude in your heart, in your life, and that strength to say no to sin. This morning I suggest to you that it is not the great sins that tear down most Christians. It's not that they cheated on their spouse. It's not that they robbed a bank. It might be that they robbed God. Amen. See, there's great discussion these days and has been for years. What does it mean to, to give to God? Should it be 10 cents, 10%, 20%? Uh, I took a study one time. It absolutely shocked me if you add up all of the offerings that there were set for Israel to follow. It's like a little over 50%. And I was like, what? I believe it was Mr. Brown of the Brown Shoe Company that started giving more to God all the time. And he ended up living on 10% and giving 90% to God. And God blessed him. And when he stopped doing that, he started losing business. So he went back to doing it. You cannot outgive God. Amen. But you can't be living in sin and thinking God's going to bless that. Amen. You can't do it. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Do you realize this indicates it's possible? If it wasn't, he wouldn't have to say this. Scripture records, I don't remember the address, where that Paul's speaking and he's talking about many different kinds of sins. And he says, and such were some of you. Which means God had forgiven them. But do you know how hard it is to go on a diet <laughs> and stick to it? Every day? Yeah. I'm going to tell you a secret. You go on a diet, there's going to be foods that will be calling your name. You'll smell them and your mouth will water and it's foods you've never eaten before. <laughs> you diet long enough and stuff you said you would never eat would probably taste good. Yeah. Except liver. <laughs> Can't do that. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized in Jesus Christ were baptized into His death. In this passage, our baptism is a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And as you go through baptism, you are saying, I am aligned with this in my life. I'm staking my claim based on what Christ did for me. I'm putting my faith in Christ and trusting Him for my eternal salvation. 
You also need to understand you're trusting him for day-to-day -day strength, day-to-day -day wisdom to no longer live in sin. Therefore, verse 4, we are buried with him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Some people thought, I just made that phrase up. <laughs> walk in newness of life. I think I've quoted this at least once. Therefore, if any man be in Christ Jesus, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all, A-L-L, -L, all, have become new. The Spirit of God will teach you walk away from sin. The Spirit of God will help you to recognize sin and to know it's sin. Generally, when you wonder about something, is it sin or is it not? You probably need to stay away from it. There's an old saying I picked up when I was a young man. If in doubt, don't. As simple as that. If in doubt, don't. If you're going to err, err on the side of righteousness, not unrighteousness. That will mean sometimes you have to tell somebody no. I'm not going to describe those circumstances this morning, but some of you know automatically some things that there are other people that think that you should be doing and how you should be acting. And in the depth of your spirit as a child of God, you know that is not for you. It's really not for them either. But they're not listening to God and they're reaping unto themselves the recompense of what they do, how they live, what they say. Understand, there's recompense to Christians also. Someone left the church because I dared to say that everybody that's lived on this earth is going to have to face judgment. Yes. Yes. Amen. There's two judgments. The judgment seat of the Christ, where that those that are not of God, those that have chose to follow the world, those that have chosen to live in sin, are separated eternally from God from that point on. They're already guilty. It's like being convicted of a crime and you come back two weeks later for sentencing. These people died in their trespassing sins. They're going to that judgment seat not to decide if they're guilty or not but to receive the sentence. They'll be the most miserable excuse making you've ever heard in your life. <laughs> Scripture tells us even be those that said, look what I did in your name. I cast out demons. I raised the dead. First of all, there's nobody here that can cast out demons or raise the dead. That's God's work, not your work. God may use you as a vessel in some of those things. But if it's truly God using you as a child of God, you won't be at the great white throne judgment. Then there's the judgment seat of Christ where the works you've performed as a Christian will be judged. Out of that, your works will be thrown into a fire is the picture that's given. And it said some of your works will burn up like wood, hay, and stubble. And some will come out as gold and silver and jewels. And you get that. And some people say, ah, I get my riches then. Okay. But you're supposed to cast those at the feet of Jesus. Yeah. 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 Understand, we all will face God's judgment in one way or the other. Do you know which judgment you would go to today if you should die? When the judgments come, would you be standing before Jesus at that great white throne to be sentenced to eternity, separated from God? 
And you know, one of them old fashioned preachers that say separated into hell. There are people debating today, well, there probably isn't a hell. It's not really hell. It was just a picture. It was just given to scare people. The church made it up to scare people. I heard that this week. I'm like, woe unto you. You need to know Christ. You need to know Christ. We'll pick up with verse 4 and continue with it next week. Therefore, we are better buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. And in the context of the verse, you will be walking in newness of life to the glory of of the Father, not to the glory of yourselves. Let's pray. Father God, I'm so thankful for this day. I thank you how, how good I feel. I see others are feeling good today. Spring is in the air. Father God, I thank you that you are in control of all things. It's a beautiful day, but Father, the true beauty of this day is to have a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Yes. It's a beautiful day because we can walk in the assurance of your presence because you'll never leave us nor forsake us. Amen. It's a beautiful day because we can walk in the guidance of your Spirit and in the strength that you provide. Father, this is the day you I will choose to walk gladly in it and praise your name for anyone who will listen. And it's in that precious name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.